our second speaker uh, for the morning, uh, who is uh, Dr. Mike Clark, who's Chief Executive of the RSP RSPB. Please welcome Mike. Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, Whoops. Those of you, those of us here yesterday um, were hearing about the scene setting in terms of just the scale of change that we have underway. Uh, and uh, my provocation really is to suggest, and this might be hard to convince a few cabinet ministers this morning or ex-cabinet ministers, that actually disruptive change can be an opportunity. And I think this is an opportunity in three respects. An opportunity to create a stronger sense of shared purpose, an opportunity to collaborate more strategically for greater collective impact, and an opportunity to move perhaps m from less of a sector and to more of a movement. So what is heritage for? I really think we need to consider different kinds of strategies. Those that think about what kind of future do we want and how do we get there, rather than projecting from the present. And that means we have, I think, the heritage sector has to look upwards and outwards. It has to particularly think to itself, how does it contribute to the greater public good? And the reason why I wanted to put this slide up is this is the Abu Simbel temples on the edge of Lake Nasser, which didn't exist before the Aswan Dam went up. And it was one of the trigger points in the late 50s to creating a global movement around world heritage. And it led, amongst other campaigns, to the World Heritage Convention in 1972. And just picking up a point yesterday from Gillian, it, it's worth having a look at the World Heritage Convention, not so necessarily that, you know, the actual clauses. Look at the whereas is, look at the rationale that led to it coming to being. Because it's very clear, it's very explicit, that the sense of shared shared heritage for humanity as a whole was very much seen as an antidote to physical symbols of nationalism and territorial place. It was part of a much bigger human endeavour. We have to articulate the relevance of heritage from the individual and local community of today to global, the global community and generations of the future. Gillian and Nick yesterday already have made the point about the need to connect the local to the global. And I would just simply pick up, we talked about cuckoos yesterday, so I've got to come back on that. Um, you know, simply to make the point that the cuckoos, if you're lucky enough to hear them, and actually if you look, really listen very hard, they actually go ookook quite a lot of the time. But they spend less than four months of the year, our cuckoos, you know, the cuckoos of the pastoral symphony and European folk culture actually spend eight months of the year elsewhere. Again, yesterday, the phrase was used, a damaging fault line between the natural heritage and cultural heritage. And this is, um, I, uh, this is uh, I, I thought it was quite an interesting metaphor, actually, because this is a flock of starlings wheeling over uh, what was the remains of the West Pier at Brighton. And the point I want to make about this, and the reason I wanted to put this slide in, is that often the language and values of heritage, I'd like to put to you, all too often default to the objects, to objects and place-based communities of interest. And I think if we are to create a greater sense of collaboration together, we need to develop a more inclusive set of values, uh, some organising ideas. And in that sense, and again, we talked yesterday about in intangible heritage, there's a mushrooming body of evidence to show the importance of the intrinsic value of nature to people. We know that the connection, connection with nature is important to people's life chances. From cradle to grave, academic attainment, physical health, mental well-being. There's something in here beyond the physical. And also, again, I, I can readily demonstrate this to you from my own organisation. We know that there are communities of interest beyond place. People value nature beyond place. The existence value of the albatross was vividly uh, demonstrated when uh, we had a campaign with our bird life partners 
for 19 out of the 21 endangered species of albatross. It was one of the most popular responses we've had in terms of our membership and the public to any campaign we've done and almost all of those members will never ever see an albatross on the high seas of the southern oceans. So what I want to put to you is that the challenges facing our sector are too big for any one organisation, indeed too big for any one segment of the, of the sector, whether it's business, government, uh, individuals or charities. And that right now there is a trend, and again I think we should be looking beyond this country, um, there's some very interesting lessons which I'll come on to in a moment from the United States, in terms of how do we find solutions at a higher level than the problem we're dealing with. Uh, we won't find the solution um, if we just stay at the level of the presenting symptoms. And this requires us to think about collaborating. And when I wanted to um, think of a, uh, how do I illustrate this, um, I was delighted last yesterday, John Holden and Robert Hewison talked about the need to uh, develop a more coherent organic system rather than thinking of us as a heritage sector. Because my analogy was heritage as an ecosystem in which you've got um, collaboration against a set of common guiding principles, all those coral polyps creating a whole new ecosystem in which there's a range of actors, there's a range of processes. And actually, there are smarter ways of being able to work collectively together. If you haven't looked at it, the references are in, um, the, paper, in, the, in the propagation paper I've produced. Um, have a look at the work that's coming out of the States, um, Robert Kramer and others because there are a number of principles that we can learn from in terms of how we can have greater collective impact for common cause. And I won't go through these in any detail, but the point is there are a set of components, conditions for success around a common agenda, common mission and values, how do we measure success, activities that can reinforce and mutually support each other, it requires communication. And I have to say, I, I wanted to say this somewhere through this talk, you know, I, I would really congratulate um, the HLF in convening this uh, event and actually being um, so willing to encourage and um, give us license to provoke. Um, but that's exactly what we need to be doing right now. And I think the other interesting thing, and this perhaps does come on to thinking for the future, there's the need to develop capacity and infrastructure. I sit within a global partnership of 120 countries and a big strand, all that we do, is how we build capacity across our network. Where is the capacity builders? Who are the capacity builders of, our, of the heritage sector? The heritage ecosystem even. I just wanted to give um, perhaps a few pointers to um, how we can perhaps develop this approach further just as some building blocks that, if you like, um, I think within the natural heritage sector, give some organising principles beyond simply a common language. We need shared frameworks for decision making. How do we organise intervention strategies so that we mutually reinforce each other? So a few examples of this in terms of, for example, last year, and it was telling that this was brought together, this report, State of Nature, by 25 principally civil society actors coming together. Essentially, this is a register of the UK's critical assets for natural heritage, the irreplaceable natural capital. We can go beyond that to look at how do we develop priorities by looking at what's at risk. What are our no regrets priorities? And I, again, I won't, don't, don't worry about the detail, but what this is, an infographic out of the state of the world's birds, again, the links in, in, in the paper. Whoops, we've lost a, yeah. And essentially at the heart of this are the one in eight birds that are threatened globally with extinction. One in eight of all the birds, world of the birds of the world are threatened with extinction. And this is now unpacking that into what are the pressures acting on those species. Um, it starts to channel and direct our resources. So a really critical model is the pressure state response model. What's the state of nature? What are the pressures on it? These are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In the Anthropocene mass extinction event, we're going to see mass extinction through the land use, deforestation and agriculture, harvesting invasive species, including our, our grey squirrel, and glo global environmental limits. 
We know those are the four key pressures that we have to act on, and we need to develop common responses to this. And just to give a final example, I wanted to sh show you one where um, we're working within the UK, looking at the processes, not just the objects, but the processes, and how do we manage those as a dynamic, continually involving. Heritage is being constantly created and recreated in, in, in natural systems. And this is a landscape scale program. Uh, we'll be hearing later from uh, John Lawton. The um, major review that John and his team brought together was essentially bringing together the understanding of the processes that underpin the natural heritage we have. In this case, more landscapes, bigger, better joined up. And this is the flow country, the peatlands of the far north of Scotland, where uh, uh, RSPB is working with a whole range of partners supported by HLF, the flows for the future. And it's about restoring the carbon cycle and the water cycle and the biodiversity processes that lay on top of that. So I think in conclusion, I just want to leave you with a thought that of course create change does create opportunity if we're prepared to move from institutional business as usual. Frankly, from my perspective, in the case of natural heritage, we have no choice. We have to do things differently. So there is an opportunity to grow a much broader heritage movement that can translate mission and values into action. And I'd like to put it to you, it's up to you and me. Thank you very much.